from our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to this special CUBE Conversation here in Palo Alto, California at the CUBE Studios, at the CUBE Headquarters. I'm John Furrier, the host of the CUBE. We're here with Dustin Kirkland, product manager at Google, a friend of theCUBE in the community uh, with Kubernetes, uh, been on theCUBE, CUBE alumni. Dustin, welcome to theCUBE conversation. Thanks, John, it's a beautiful studio. I've never been in the studio. I've been uh, on the show floor a few times, but this, yeah. is, this is fun. Great to have you on. Um, great uh, opportunity to chat about Kubernetes, yep. of which you do have some product management work at Google, but really more importantly on this conversation is about the fifth anniversary, the birthday of Kubernetes. Today we're celebrating the fifth birthday of Kubernetes. Still a, still a toddler. Uh, absolutely. Still growing. Yeah. You think about how old, you know, uh, Linux has been around for a long time, OpenStack has been around, these other big projects that have been around for, uh, you know, going on uh, decades in, in Linux's case, and Kubernetes has grown so fast, but it's only five years old, you know? You know, I remember um, at an OpenStack um, event in Seattle many, many years ago, I think it was six years ago, mm -hmm. Cube's on its 10th year, so uh, I'm going to have these look backs moments. This is one of them. I was having a beer with Lou Tucker, JJ, um, Kismatic was like one of the first companies at the time, didn't make it, but we were talking about OpenStack, and I was like, this Kubernetes thing, this is really hot. This paper, this initiative, this could really be the abstraction layer to kind of bring all this, you know, cloud native, wasn't talked about at the time, but it was like more of you know, OpenStack trying to move up the stack. And it turned out it ended up happening. Kubernetes then went on to change the landscape of what containers did. Docker got a lot of credit for, for pioneering that, got the big VC funding, became a unicorn, and then containers kind of went into a different direction because of Kubernetes. Very much so. I mean, the modernization of software infrastructure has been coming for a long time, and Kubernetes sort of brings it all brings it all together uh, at, at this point. But putting software into a container, we've been doing that in different forms for, for, for a lot of time, uh, for a long time. But, but once you have a lot of containers, what do you do with that, right? And that was the problem that Kubernetes solved so eloquently and has you know, now for a couple of years and it just keeps getting better. You, know, you mentioned modernization, let's talk about that because I think the modernization uh, theme is now pretty much prevalent in every vertical. I'll be in DC next week for the Amazon Web Service Public Sector Summit where modernization of governments and nations are being discussed, hmm. uh, education, modernization of IT, we've seen it here, the media business that we're participating in is about not where you store the code, it's how you code, how you build, yep. is a mindset shift. This has been the real revelation around the DevOps movement, infrastructure as code, now called cloud native. Share your thoughts on, on this modernization mindset, because it really is how you build. Yeah, I, I think the cross-pollination actually across industries, and we, we even we see that even just in the word containers, right? And all the imagery around shipping and shipping containers. We've applied these age-old concepts that have been, I don't know if perfected, but certainly optimized over decades of actually centuries or millennia of moving things across water in, in containers, right? But we apply that to software and boom, we have the step function difference in, in the way that we, uh, we manage and we orchestrate and, and administer code. And that's one example of that cross-pollination. And now you're talking about like optimizing, uh, optimizing governments or economies, but being able to maybe then apply other concepts that we've come a long way in computer science. Dev, DevOps is a good example. Uh, you know, applying DevOps principles to, to non-computer fields. Just think about that for a second. And it's mind blowing. And if you think about also the step function you mentioned, because I think this actually changed a lot of the entrepreneurial landscape as well, and also has shaped open source. Mm. And you know, big news this, this quarter is MapR's going to shut down. This is the Hadoop, one of the big Hadoop players. Cloudera merged with Hortonworks, mm. uh, fired their CEO. The founder, Mike Olson, has retired. Um, some say forced out. I don't think so. I think it's more of his time. Uh, Amar Adal is still there. Open source is a business model. You know, the, can we be the red hat for Hadoop? The red hat, not really kind of the viable, but it's evolving. So open source has been impacted by this step function. There's a business impact. Talk about the dynamics of the step function, both on the business side and on how software is built, specifically open source. You know, you and I have been around open source for a long, long time. I think it started when I was in college in the late 90s, uh, and then through my career at IBM. And it's it's interesting how on the fringe open source was for for so long and such a, so so much of my IBM career and then early time I spent on site at, at Red Hat uh, it was it was something that was it was different it was weird it was uh, it was very much fringe worthy right yeah. uh, 
but now it's in the mainstream and it's, it's everywhere and it's so mainstream that it's almost the de facto uh, standard to, to just start with open source. But you know, there's some other news that's been happening lately that you didn't bring up, but it's a really touchy aspect of open source right now, uh, and that's on some of the licenses and, and the, yeah. how those licenses get applied by software, especially databases, uh, when offered as a service uh, in, in the cloud. That's one of the big problems, I think, uh, that, that's, that we're, we're, um, we're working with in the open source community. Summarize right the news now. and what, what it means. What's, what's happening, what's the news, and what's the real um, business or technical impact to the, to the licensing? What's the issue? What's the core issue? Yeah, so without taking judgment any, any way, shape, or form on this, the, 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 the TLDR on this is uh, a number of open source databases, most recently Cockroach uh, DB, have adopted a different licensing model that is non-standard from an open source perspective. Uh, and from one perspective, they are, they're adopting these different licensing models because other vendors can take that software and offer it as a service. And in some, some cases- Like Amazon. Like, sure, you said it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and offer it as a, as a service uh, and maybe contribute, maybe pay money to the, the smaller startup or the open source community behind it, but not necessarily. Uh, and it's, um, in some ways, it's quite threatening to uh, open source communities and open source companies. Uh, in other cases, it's quite empowering, and it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, the tension between open sourcing software and eventually making money off of it is something that we've, we've seen for you know, at least 25 yeah, and years. And it continues now. to go on today, and this is, to me, a real fascinating area that I think is going to be super important to keep an eye on because you want to encourage contribution and openness. Mm -hmm. At the same time, if you look at the scale of just the Linux Foundation's numbers, it's pretty massive in terms of now the open source contribution when you factor in even China and other nations. It's, it's on exponential growth. That's right. So is it just open source is the model? Not necessarily a business model. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the big question, no one knows. I, I think we've crossed that and open source is, is the model. Um, the, and this is where me as a, a product manager that's worked around open source, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how to create commercial uh, offerings around open source. Uh, I, I spent 10 years at Canonical, the first half of which as an engineer, the second half of which as a product manager around uh, Ubuntu, building services, commercial services around Ubuntu. And I, I learned quite a few things uh, that now apply absolutely to Kubernetes as well as to a number of open source startups that, uh, that I've advised uh, and kind of given them some perspective on uh, maybe some successful and unsuccessful ways to, to monetize that, that open source. Okay, so uh, Dustin, talk about, let's get back to Kubernetes because I think this is the, the next level talk track is, as Kubernetes has established itself and landed in the industry and has adoption, it's now in expansion mode. So land, adopt, and expand. We see an adoption, mm -hmm. now it's in expansion mode. Where does it go from here? Because if you look at the tell signs, things like service meshes, um, serverless, you've got some interesting trends that are going to support this expansionary stage of Kubernetes. What is your view about the, this next expansionary wave? What, of what comes next, yeah. Um, I, think, I think the next stage is really about democratizing Kubernetes for workloads that, uh, you know, it's quite obvious where, when Kubernetes is the right answer at the scale of a Google or a Twitter or a Netflix or, you know, some of these massive services that it is obviously and clearly the best answer to orchestrating containers. Now, I think the next question is how does that same thing that works at that massive scale also work for me as a developer at a very small scale? Uh, helps me develop my software, my small team of five or 10 people. Do I need a Kubernetes if I'm a, a five or 10 person startup? Well, I mean, not the original sort of Borg vision of, of Kubernetes, it's probably overkill. Uh, but actually, the tooling has really advanced and we now have uh, Kubernetes that makes sense on very small scales. You've got things like K3S from, uh, from Rancher, you've got MicroKates from, from uh, my colleagues at Canonical, other ways of making, shrinking Kubernetes down to something that fits uh, perhaps on devices, perhaps uh, at the edge, beyond just the traditional data center and into remote locations that need to deploy and manage uh, applications. On the Kubernetes um, clustering and the, some of the tech side, you know, we've seen some great tech trends. I was mentioning Cloudera and Hortonworks and MapR. Let's take Cloudera and Hortonworks. I remember back in the old Hadoop days when it was booming, um, people say, oh, they were so proud to talk about their clusters. I stood up all these clusters. And then I would, I would ask them, well, what are you doing with it? Well, we're storing data, I think. So there became kind of this use case where 
standing up the cluster was the use case and then like, okay, now let's put some data in it. So the question for you is, with Kubernetes it's a little bit different, we're not seeing that, we're seeing real use cases. What are people standing up Kubernetes clusters for? What's specific, besides, the say, besides saying I've done it, yeah. what are they, what's the main use case that you're seeing that's, that has real value? Yeah, actually, I, I, there's, you just jogged uh, to, to mine a really funny memory, you know, back in, in those big data days. I was a CTO of a startup, we were encrypting data, and we were helping encrypt uh, healthcare data for, for healthcare companies. And the number of healthcare companies that I worked with at that time who, who said they had a big data problem, and they had all of, I don't know, three, three terabytes worth of, worth of data that they needed to encrypt. It, it was kind of humorous sometimes, like, <laughs> is that really a big, big data problem? This, fits on a single disk, you know? Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's interesting how that- But the hype of, of the tech was preceding the reality. The needs. The needs, it, yeah. so it's Kubernetes. So I have a Kubernetes cluster for blank, fill in the blank, what are people saying? Yeah, uh, it's, it's largely about the modernization. So uh, I need to modernize my infrastructure. I'm going to adopt a platform that's probably not uh, the old uh, Java web, web sphere type platform or, or something like that. I'm, I'm investing in hardware, I'm investing in software, middleware, I'm investing in people, and I want all of those things to line up with where the industry is going from a software perspective. Uh, and that's where Kubernetes is sort of the, the, the cornerstone piece of that. Linux, of course, it, that's, that's pretty well established. So right? is it in the, in the continuous delivery and an integration piece of it? Is it the pipelining? What's the, where's the fit on the, the, the low hanging fruit use cases of Kubernetes? Just development process or? Uh, it's the operations. It's the operations of now I've got software that I need to deploy across multiple versions, perhaps multiple sites. Uh, I need to handle the, that upgrade, uh, ideally without downtime, in a way that, you said service mesh, in a way that meshes together, it makes sense. I've got to roll out new certificates, I, I need to address a security vulnerability. These are all the things that Kubernetes does such a better job at than what people were doing previously, which was a whole lot of for loops, shell scripts, and, and SSH pushing, uh, yeah. pushing tarballs around, maybe devs or RPMs uh, around. Uh, that is what Kubernetes actually uh, it really solves and, and does an elegant job of solving as just a starting point, and that's just the beginning. And you know, without getting vendory here, you know, Anthos is the thing that we at, at Google have built yeah. around Kubernetes that brings it to enterprise. Yeah, the other day I did a tweet. I called it Anthem. I was typing too fast. I got a lot of <laughs> crap on Twitter for that. You mentioned Anthos. Multi-cloud has been a big part of where Kubernetes seems to fit. Um, you mentioned some of the licensing changes. Cloud has been a great um, resource for a lot of the, the new web scale applications from all kinds of companies, now IT. With serverless, you're seeing a lot more of these capabilities. How do you see um, the next shift with data state coming in? Because you've got stateless data and you've got um, um, stateful data. Yeah. Uh, this has become a conversation point. Yeah, uh, I think Kelsey Hightower has said it pretty eloquently, as he usually does, around the, the sort of the serverless movement. It lets, it lets developers focus on just their code, and literally just their code, perhaps even just their function, or just their piece of code, without having to be an expert on all of the turtles all the way, all the way down. That's the big difference about serverless. Have, having written a couple of those functions, I can, I can really invest my time on the couple of hundred lines of code that matter, and not choosing a distro, choosing a Kubernetes, choosing you know, all the, the, the stack underneath. I, I simply choose the platform where I'm going to drop that, that function, compile it, upload it, and then riff and rev on that. Fifth anniversary of Kubernetes, we're riffing on Kubernetes. Uh, Dustin Kirkland here, inside the Cube, Cube alumni. You were recently at the KubeCon um, in, uh, overseas in Europe. Barcelona. Barcelona, great city, Cube's been there many times. Stu was there uh, covering for us. I uh, couldn't make this trip, unfortunately. Had to, a couple of daughters graduating, so I <laughs> didn't make the trip, sorry guys. Um, what was the summary, what was the takeaway? What was the big uh, walk away from that event? What synthesized the, the main stories? What were the most important stories being told? Uh, big news, big observations. It was a huge event to start with. Uh, it was at Fira Barcelona. Um, it didn't take over the, the whole space, but I've been there a number of times for Mobile World Congress. But you know, this is, this is KubeCon in the same building that hosts all of Mobile World Congress. So uh, I think 8,000 attendees was what we saw. Uh, it's quite celebratory, you know, I think we were doing some, some pre-fifth birthday bash uh, celebrations. Uh, key takeaways, um, hybrid, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud. I think that's the world that we've uh, evolved into. Uh, you know, there was a lot of tension, I think, in the early days about must stay on-prem, must go to the cloud. Everything, there's going to be a winner and a loser and, and everything's going to go one direction or another. 
I think the chips have fallen, and it's pretty obvious now that the world will exist in a very hybrid, multi-cloud uh, uh, state, ultimately. There's going to be some stuff on-prem that doesn't move. There's going to be some stuff better hosted in one or more public clouds. That's the multi-cloud aspect. Uh, and there will be some stuff at the edge and in remote locations, in vehicles, on oil rigs, at, at restaurants and stores, and so forth. What's most exciting from a trend standpoint? What do you, what, what's, uh, What's getting you excited from what you see on the landscape out there? Yeah, so the tying all of that to Kubernetes, Kubernetes is the thing that basically normalizes all of that. You know, you write your application, put it in a container, and expect a Kubernetes uh, to be there uh, to, to scale that, to operate that, to upgrade that, to, to migrate that over time. From that perspective, Kubernetes has really ticked, ticked all of the boxes, and you've got a lot of choices now about which Kubernetes you're, you're going to use and, and where. Beyond Kubernetes, um, a lot of variety of projects, uh, Kubeflow, you got service meshes out there, a lot of different projects. What's what's a dark horse? What's something that, that's out there that people should be paying attention to that you see uh, emerging mm. that's notable that should be paying attention to? Uh, I think it's a combination of two things. One is pretty obvious, and that's AI ML is coming like a freight train and is sort of the next layer of excitement, I think after Kubernetes becomes boring, which hopefully if we've done our job well, that Kubernetes layer gets settled and will evolve, but the, the, the sort of the hockey stick hopefully settles down and it becomes something super stable. Uh, the application of machine learning to, to create artificial intelligence, conclusions, uh, trends from things, that is sort of the next big trend. Uh, and then I would say another one, if you really want the dark horse, I think it's around communications, and I think it's around the difference in the way that we communicate with one another across all forms of media, voice, video, chat, writing, how we interact with people, how we interact with our, our tools, with our software, and in fact, how our software interacts with us and our software interacts with, with other software. That communications industry is it's ripe for some pretty radical disruption, and you know some of the organizations and yeah. they're doing that. It's early, early days on, on those changes. Final point, you mentioned earlier in our conversation here about how DevOps is impl uh, influencing and impacting non-tech and computer science related. What did you mean by that? Uh, well, y I think you brought up uh, it's un unexpectedly in that, that you were looking at the way uh, some other industries are, are changing, and I think that cross-pollination is, is actually quite, quite powerful. When you take and apply a skill and expertise you have outside of your industry, but it adds something new and interesting to, to your, your, your professional uh, environment, that's where you get these provocative operations, these really creative, innovative things that you know, no one really saw coming. DevOps principles apply to other disciplines. Yeah. Agility, that's, that's taking one down waterfall-based processes. That's one phenomenal example. Imagine that for governments, right? Yeah. To, to remove some of the, like, the pain that you and I know. I've got to go and renew my license. My birthday's coming up. I've got to go and renew my driver's license. You know how much I'm dreading going to the, yeah. the, the DMV? Uh, Root why? canal, driver's license, all in the same. Exactly. You know. How waterfall is that experience? And could, yeah. we, could we be more, more agile, more DevOpsy in, in some of our government processes? The U.S. government's uh, procurement practices are based upon 1990 standards, they still want request a manual, yep. uh, a physical manual for every product they buy. Like, look, who does that? I, I know that there are organizations trying to apply some open source principles to, to government, but I mean, think about you know just democracy and how uh, being a little bit more open and transparent in the way that we are in open source code, uh, the ability to accept patches. Uh, I have a side project, a passion for brewing beer, and I love applying open source practices to uh, the, the industry of, of, of brewing, and that's a, an example of where I use professional work to complement a, a hobby. All right, we got to bring some cube beer. Can we private <laughs> label some uh, cube beer? Uh, if you like sour beer, I'm <laughs> in the sour beer. I hope okay. that's okay. No, we like to get the IPAs, um, <laughs> double IPAs for us. Final question for you, F five years from now, Kubernetes is going to be 10 years old. What's the world going to look like uh, when we wake up five years from now with the impact I, of Kubernetes? Just yeah, I think uh, we're. I don't think we're struggling with the Kubernetes, uh, the Kubernetes layer at that point. I think that's settled science, in as much as Linux is pretty settled science. Yes, there's a release, and it comes out with with incremental features and bug fixes. I think Kubernetes is, is settled science. Management of of those containers is is pretty well settled. Uh, five years from now, I think we end up with software, some software that's that's writing software, and I don't quite mean that in the way that sounds scary. Uh, and that we're eliminating uh, developers, but I think we're creating more powerful, more robust software 
uh, that actually creates that, that software. And that's all built on top of the, the really strong, robust systems we have underneath. Automation to take the heavy lifting, but the human creation still keep humans, part of it. Humans are in the loop. Uh, it's, right. we're, we're many decades away from humans being out of the loop on creative processes. Dustin Kirkland here, product manager at Google, uh, Kubernetes guru, also CUBE alumni here in the studio, talking about the Kubernetes 50 year anniversary. Of course, the CUBE was present at creation during the beginning of the wave of Kubernetes. We love the trend, we love cloud, we love talking about tech. I'm John Furrier here in Palo Alto. Thanks for watching. <laughs>